We're going to take a quiz tonight. Pop quiz, pop quiz. Welcome to everybody. Welcome to everybody. The first uh, first service that we've met in the new year. So, so that's uh, pretty cool. And we are starting into the Book of Mark, and going to go through that for for a few weeks here. So your pop quiz. I want you to listen to these uh, sayings that I have. Be thinking in your mind, and you're going to tell me who said these. These are all attributed to one person. There's about 20 of them. Okay? Quality, not quantity. Honesty is the best policy. Pride comes before a fall. Revenge is a two-edged sword. Don't make much ado about nothing. In other words, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. It's easy to kick a man when he's down. The phrase, to take the lion's share. Don't count your chickens before they're hatched. Necessity is the mother of invention. Look before you leap. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. One good turn deserves another. Fair weather friends are not much worth. The term to have sour grapes, also attributed to this person. Slow and steady ruins the race. Birds of a feather flock together. Nip evil in the bud. Does anybody remember on Andy Griffith when Barney was always saying, nip it in the bud? Every... Every book on child rearing is in, in favor of bud nipping. A man is known by the company he keeps. Out of the frying pan, into the fire. And the last one here, and the one that I want to capitalize on, good things come in small packages. Okay? Now those are all attributed to one person. Can anybody tell me who that is? Uh, yes, yeah, some of them actually are shameless, shamelessly ripped off from the Bible. What's that? Uh, no? Nope, it's not Mark Twain. It's like way before any of them. Much Ado About Nothing Shakespeare used, but it wasn't from Shakespeare. Nope. It was from somebody who was born around 600 B.C. Does that help you at all? You, huh? <laughs> Did you say Dave? <laughs> Me. I was born 600 B.C. A- Aesop. Aesop's fables. Remember that? And he was a uh, Greek uh, fabulist and storyteller, of course. He was born around 600 B.C. And so he put all of those together, and those things have been recycled over and over and over again, and used in plays, and used in writing, and used in, in all kinds of things. Yeah, and Shake, yeah, Shakespeare um, used some of those, and, and all that too. So that came from Aesop, Aesop, and Aesop's fables. Now, the thing that I want to capitalize on is good things come in small packages. Because when we look at the Gospels, and when we look at the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Mark is the shortest gospel that there is. And so uh, we are going to study that, and we're going to kind of kind of look at that a little bit. And so it is one of the smallest of the, of the gospels. If we can think a little bit about the gospels, think of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are uh, a biography of Jesus, right? So they basically, you know, they told the story of Jesus. And they, it's interesting because they tell it from different angles. In the same way, if you can kind of think of it a little bit like a movie, you have multiple cameras in a movie. And so you might have one camera that's showing the bad guy doing his nefarious things, and then you've got another camera that's showing the good guy doing his heroic things, or you've got uh, you know, somebody escaping in a car or a gunshot going off or something like that. And you're seeing maybe this whole scene that's going on, but you're seeing it from different camera angles, right? That's kind of the way that the Gospels are, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so they take different perspectives 
of the gospel. And so as we look at this, we're going to look at the way that, uh, that Mark does this. Now, Mark is uh, John Mark, and he was uh, actually is thought that as he, uh, as he began to record these type of things, he was in his late teens or his early 20s. So he was very, very young as he began to do this, and he was considered a disciple of Peter. He probably didn't follow Jesus around as much because he was so young. Uh, there is speculation that in the last part of Mark, there was, um, at when Jesus was uh, ready to be crucified, there was a young man that they uh, tried to grab a hold of, and he, he left his clothes, and he, he, the Bible says he ran off naked. Um, it's speculated that that was actually John Mark. And so, um, so he actually fled probably like, like most of the disciples did at that point. So John was his Hebrew name. Mark, or Marcus, was his Roman name. And uh, as he began to compile this and look at this, uh, he, he actually was, was probably a disciple of Peter in that. Now, as we look a little bit on down the line in the book of Acts, John Mark's mother was named Mary. And in her house was the house that the early church met in after the upper room experience of Acts 2. So it was her house that, that they met in. Do you remember the story that when Peter got thrown into prison and the, the, uh, the early church gathered around and they began to pray for his release and remember that the earthquake came and it shook, shook the prison and it opened up the prison and he, and he got out and he went to the house and he knocked on the door and Rhoda, the little servant girl, came to the door and opened up the door and there's Peter standing there and she got so excited that she just closed the door in Peter's face and she went back and went back into the prayer meeting and she said to the people, what? She said, Peter's standing out there at the door. The guy that you've been praying for is standing out there at the door. And what did the people say? You're nuts, right? You're crazy. What, what a lot of faith they had in there. Well, when they were meeting, they were meeting at John Mark's mother, mother's house, whose name was Mary, okay? So she was... Uh, she was probably wealthy because she had a servant girl named Rhoda. And, uh, and so the early church kind of met there. And this is kind of the, uh, the heritage that John Mark grew up in. Remember also that with, uh, remember Paul and Barnabas in the book of Acts, they start to travel. And as they travel, Barnabas wants to take John Mark with them. And so Paul allows John Mark to begin to come with them, Right. This is the first missionary journey. At a certain point, then John Mark says, no, I don't want want to do this anymore. I want to go home. Remember that? This was when Paul and Barnabas had the big split. Barnabas took John Mark. Paul took Silas. And they kind of went their separate ways at that point. John Mark was actually Barnabas' nephew. So Barnabas and Mary were brother and sister. Even though the Bible calls him his cousin, technically he, he was his nephew. Now, if you're wondering, Paul did reconcile later on because he tells Timothy. He says, uh, go ahead when you come to visit me, bring John Mark because he is, he's expedient for my ministry. And so there was a certain point that Paul kind of forgave that, uh, that, that situation. So there's a little bit of background there, and that is what I want you to kind of keep in mind as we are starting into the book of Mark. This is the foundation, and this is who he was, and we'll talk more about John Mark a little bit later. But as he writes this, I want you to notice that he is very young when this takes place, very young when he begins to write it, and he's late teens, early 20s, and he has a whole different writing style than the other Gospels do. Luke comes from the physician side, so he's more technical in what he does. Mark comes from the side of action. Yes, thank you, action. And, and everything is immediate. So, for instance, um, as we start into this, and and Marge is going to help me, we're going to kind of tag team a little bit. Uh, Go ahead, let's go to the first one. Marge, if you will read this for me. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Okay. Notice that Mark does not start with a genealogy like Luke does or like Matthew does. 
he gets immediately right into the action. And this is one of the things uh, that Mark has and that Mark does, and he, uh, he uses this throughout his, his whole book. So he, um, he uses the conjunction and and now 1,331 times in the Gospel of Mark. So he's always, because of his youngness, because of his youth, it's always, and then we went here and did this, and then we went here and did this. And, and you can kind of see him sitting at the feet of Peter and saying, okay, what happened next? What did you guys do next? You know, can, can you imagine that you've got Peter who traveled around with Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, and now Mark's interviewing him and writing down this gospel and saying, okay, where did you go next? What did you do then? And as you look at Mark and as you begin to read through Mark, and I encourage you to do that, read ahead, read the entire book. It's not going to even take you very long to read the entire book. But as you look at that, I want you to notice those things, that it's, and now we went here, and immediately this happened, and then we went over here. And as he begins, he says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the word that he uses here is euangelion, which is the gospel, or what's the gospel mean? Good news. Okay, so it is good news. And and so he's saying here, this is the good news of Jesus Christ. This is the great news that we bring. And as he moves, he moves from one place to another. Script writing. When you write a script, a script, one page equals one minute on screen. That's the way, that's the way they do it. So, for instance, when you have the Lord of the Ring trilogy and especially the extended version, is about 570, or, I'm sorry, 507 minutes long. So you've got a script that is about 500 pages long, for, and this is the entire, you know, the entire trilogy there. And so it's about nine and a half hours uh, that, that is there. So when, when you've got that, if you can kind of keep that in mind as Mark is writing here, he is writing this immediacy and going right into it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to explore that. And the theme that, that Mark has in his gospel and the theme that he looks at throughout the entire gospel is Jesus as the servant. That's the theme of the entire book. That's the way that he looks at Jesus with everything that goes on. Okay? Now, uh, Marge and I are going to kind of go back and forth a little bit with this. So, uh, so he starts out, in the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written by the prophet Isaiah, I will send my messenger ahead of you and will prepare your way. A voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the paths for him. And as it uh, gets into the action here, it says, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem came out to see him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around the waist and ate locusts and wild honey. Now, Kurt, go to the next one. This is who I picture when I picture John the Baptist. Does anybody know who this is? He's an actor in the 80s, because all great actors were in the 80s, of course. Randall Tex Cobb. He was a former boxer turned, uh, turned actor. And uh, Randall Tex Cobb, this movie that he was in was called Raising Arizona with Nicolas Cage. Does anybody remember that? Raising Arizona. So he was like a bounty hunter in here. So, uh, so when I see John the Baptist, I think of Randall Tex Cobb in this, in this role. That, that John the Baptist was a wild man. That he wore uh, leather, he wore skins, he wore a leather belt, he ate locusts and wild honey, uh, just all kinds of different things. Now, I'm not going to make you look at this picture the whole time that I'm talking about John the Baptist. Uh, so, Kurt, go, go on to the next one. Um, so, as we look at this in Mark, it's interesting here that he was kind of a wild man, and his message 
He says, after me, this is verse number seven, after me comes the one more powerful than I am, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to step down, to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with the water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Remember who John the Baptist was. First of all, he was Jesus' cousin. He was filled with the Holy Spirit from Elizabeth's womb. Okay? His father was Zechariah. He could have very well, and in the other Gospels, it talks about the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming out to kind of confront him on various things. And this is when he says, well, they, they come out and they, said, they say, are you Elijah? And he says, no. Or are you one of the other great prophets? No, I'm not. You know, who are you? Well, I'm just, I'm just a voice. I'm just a voice who's crying in the wilderness. The one who's going to come after me, I'm not worthy to stoop down and to untie his shoes, basically, is what he was saying. He could have said, well, well, I'm the son of a high priest. You know, I was filled with God's spirit in the womb. I, had, uh, I was a miraculous baby. He could have boasted of, of all of those things, but he doesn't. Because he has that servant mindedness. He has that servant heart. And as we talk about this, we're going to talk about, uh, about five different things about servanthood here. And one of them is to be servant minded and to have that inspiration of being a servant. And that's the way that it is with you and me. In order for you and me to be a servant like Jesus was a servant, we have to be servant minded. We have to be thinking about serving. We have to be thinking about how it is that I can serve other people. And keeping that in mind as we go here. Uh, go ahead and go on to the next. Okay, uh, Marge, would you read this one? And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Okay. And so he was testifying of Jesus coming. And as Jesus comes, in verse number 9, at this time Jesus came from Nazareth into Galilee, we're going to talk about that, and was baptized of John in the Jordan River. This is actually a picture of the Jordan. This is part of the, um, some of the headwaters of the Jordan uh, there. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water and saw the heavens being, tor uh, being torn open, the Spirit descended on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my son in whom I am well pleased. And at once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. But I want to talk about the baptism of Jesus for just a second here. Mark is going action to action to action. He's not going into genealogy. He's not uh, going into this is where Jesus came from. Here's, you know, who he was. Anything like that. It's, it's like, okay, we're going to go to action to action to action. So Jesus comes down. He's being baptized of John. Notice here of the deity and the trinity that is present. We've got God the Father, we've got God the Son who's being baptized, and we've got God the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove coming to light on Jesus. The words that are spoken out of heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, is very important and it's very interesting. You see, in the Jewish custom and in the Jewish faith, when a son would be bar mitzvahed, when he would come of age, around 13 years of age, they would have a huge party for him because he is now technically becoming a Jewish man. And what would happen is that the fathers would take their sons and would hoist them onto their shoulders and say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And it would be a broadcast and and uh, putting out to everyone there that they were their heirs, that they, were, uh, they had the power of the Father, that they uh, had all of the blessing that came with that. Jesus didn't get that from Joseph because Joseph was not technically Jesus' father. Does that make sense? Because he was born of a virgin, right? The and, and just a side note here, the interesting thing, the bloodline of a baby comes from the father. I don't know if you knew that or not. 
but Jesus' bloodline came from the Father. That's why his blood was pure, and that's why he could, could lay his life down and shed his blood for the remission of our sins because his blood was pure coming from the Father. So that's just a side note. So Joseph did not have that to be able to do that with Jesus because technically Jesus wasn't his son. And as you see this, and as you see this baptism, this is, this is uh, bringing Jesus out into his public ministry and out to all of the people of God the Father hoisting him on his shoulder and saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so you've got the Father, you've got the Son, you've got the Holy Spirit here. Now, immediately he goes out into the wilderness. So the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted of Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels tended him. Now, you know, with the story that goes out in the other Gospels of all the different things that Jesus did when he was in the wilderness, he talked to Satan, and Satan tried to tempt him, and t Satan tried to talk to him and all. Um, Mark didn't really feel that that was uh, important to go into detail. He just kind of skimmed right over it. Yeah, uh, the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. He was tempted of Satan. He was out there with all wild animals and everything. And then he goes on, okay? <laughs> so, um, okay. So he comes back and it says, After John went to prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of the gospel. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Okay? So we've got, uh, we've got Mark, and he just kind of he just sends it out there, and he just goes from one place uh, to another. Okay, uh, go to, yes, let me see. So, 14, I'm just kind of tracking here. Okay, good. Okay, uh, Marge, go ahead and reiterate this and read it again, please. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Okay. This is a picture of the Sea of Galilee. A little bit more modern, of course, with this boat here. Galilee was kind of Jesus' inauguration. And it's important with the servanthood of Christ to see this inauguration because of actually Galilee. Now, Jesus uh, was from different places during his lifetime. But one of the places that he especially spent a lot of time was in Galilee. He lived in Galilee during most of his life, and most of his mortal ministry was conducted there. During his time on earth, Jesus established his gospel, and many of the events leading up to the sacrifice started in Galilee. So Galilee was very important. Galilee was split into a lower half and also an upper half. And uh, there was approximately about, uh, about 20 cities between the two areas. And lower Galilee had plains and hills. And upper Galilee was called actually the Galilee of the Gentiles. And it was kind of more mountainous and all. Now, remember, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Then they had to flee to Egypt. Then they came back to Nazareth. Okay? So everybody tracking with me? Okay. So born in Bethlehem, fleeing to Egypt, going back to uh, Nazareth. What is it that they said about Nazareth? Yeah, can anything good come out of Nazareth, right? He, uh, Jesus will, in a little bit, start to call his disciples. And when he calls Nathaniel, Nathaniel says, <laughs> can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's kind of interesting to me also that Nathaniel kind of said that. He kind of almost scoffed a little bit. But in but just like the next verse or the next two verses after that, Jesus looks at him and says, here is a man in whom there is no guile. So Jesus must have liked his honesty anyway, because, because he, you know, he, he, he even complimented him and blessed him after he had said that. But they said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, I'm not um, pointing fingers 2024 at this point, right? When I was growing up here in Denver, we said the same thing about Commerce City. Because Commerce City had all of the oil refineries and all of those things, and Commerce City stunk. 
And those of you who have been around Denver for any length of time knew that Commerce City always stunk, right? It always did. And I can remember as a kid that my parents would always talk about Commerce City. Oh, it's just Commerce City stinks. Now, Commerce City has remade itself. It has all kinds of really nice places now. It doesn't stink so much when you drive through it and everything. So they've revamped the whole, you know, the whole thing for the most part. But I can kind of see a little bit of when they said, oh, yeah, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's like, oh, you live in Commerce City? Oh, okay, well, bless your heart, you know, type of thing, right? And, uh, and that's kind of what I think about when I, when I think about that. Now, in Galilee, of course, it was the Roman Empire, and it was what they called a client kingdom, and it was ruled by Herod Antipas, who was the son of Herod the Great. And so uh, they, claim, they were claimed by the Roman citizens without direct rule. So Galilee had the Roman uh, government that was there, but the Roman government kind of had their hands off and let them practice their Jewish religion and practice their festivals and practice all of those things. And among those were, of course, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, remember, and just a side note here, remember that the, uh, the Pharisees, uh, they were kind of middle class. They taught in the synagogue. Uh, there was, uh, they, they gave more equality between the Old Testament and the written word. They believed in the resurrection of the dead, the afterlife, uh, also appropriate rewards and punishment. The, the, the Sadducees were opposite. They were kind of the elite, and they were the aristocrats. They, uh, they only believed in the written law, so they didn't believe in any, any kind of oral law, and they didn't believe in the spiritual. They, they kind of rejected that. It's very interesting that during the Jewish revolt, which was, I think it was 70 AD. Something like that. Anyway, um, the Sadducees basically were obliterated. They weren't around anymore. The Pharisees are still around, but the Sadducees were obliterated. And there is no recorded place that I have found or that I've studied or that I've heard anybody else talk about a Sadducee ever coming to Christ talks about Pharisees who came to Christ. Who was a Pharisee that came to Christ? Nicodemus was one, who was another very famous Pharisee that came to... Okay, Joseph, Arimathea, who else? Paul. Paul came to Christ, and he was a Pharisee, right? So there's accounts of Pharisees coming, but there's never an account of a Sadducee coming, if you, uh, if you kind of look into that. So anyway, because they were sad, you see. That's right, exactly. Um, okay, so when we talk about uh, Galilee here, it was very distinct in Jesus' ministry, and it was very important in Jesus' ministry because it was kind of his hometown. It was kind of his home area. And what does that say to you and me? When we first have the servant-mindedness to be a servant like Jesus, we have to start where we live. We have to start with our hometown. We have to start with our family. We have to start with those of, that are closest to us. We have to start with those friends and family that are surrounding us because we have to be servant-minded in that way that we have that servant mind, that we love people with a servant mind, and we begin to serve the people that are around us. And that's where Jesus started. Because as he talks about here, as he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is hand, repent and believe in the gospel, and he starts it at home. He starts it close to him. Galilee was significant because it was where Jesus performed so many of his miracles. He turned the water to wine, the Sermon on the Mount was there, the transfiguration of Jesus was there, he taught parables and lessons and miracles, he walked on the water on the Sea of, the Ga uh, on the sea of Galilee, he calmed the storm. He was baptized there by John. He feeds the 5,000. Nazareth was in the region of, of Galilee. So Jesus was going home to minister first. He called the fishermen there. Peter, James, John, Andrew. It was all in Galilee. Now, 
he says that. And let's go ahead here. Uh, 16. Go to the next slide. Okay. We're going to go to that in a minute. So verse number 16, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net. And they were fishermen. He said, come follow me. I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and they followed him. And when he had gone a little bit further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat preparing their nets. And without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat and the hired men and followed him. (laughs) Get Get a picture of that. Here's the family business that they're working on, right? They're out there fishing because Galilee was a, a center of commerce. And they were out there fishing, and, and uh, they were out there kind of mending their nets and doing the things that they're supposed to be doing. And Jesus comes along and calls to them and says, hey, follow me. Come with me. Right? And immediately, there was something that was within them because of the servant heart of Jesus that they tell their dad, hey, we're going to go follow this guy. And they, and they just left their dad and the servants there mending the nets, and they go off to follow this guy, right? Now, that's supernatural within itself right there, okay? Okay, so, so we've got servant-mindedness. We started our own family. We started our own hometown. We start to serve those that are around us and that are closest to us and asking, you know, how can I serve you? And when we do this, don't be surprised if there's going to be opposition. Marge? Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. He cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus is in the synagogue at this point. And uh, there are certain uh, areas in the synagogue. There are certain people in the synagogue, the elders and the high priests and everything. But there was also uh, another area there of people that wanted to get up and share the scripture. And at this point, Jesus was actually sharing the scripture. And as he was getting up and as he was talking, all of a sudden, this guy that was demon-possessed starts yelling at him and saying to him, you know, leave us alone. What are you doing here? Obviously, this man had multiple demons because he kept saying we, right? So he had multiple demons there, and, and he, was, he was yelling out to Jesus. Now, if you go on and you read in the account there, Jesus rose up, and he, he basically said, be quiet. And he cast the unclean spirit out of him. And when it came out of them, all of a sudden, the people that were in the synagogue, they all marveled at this power and this authority that he, that he came with. Keep in mind that when you have a servant-mindedness and you begin to serve the people that are around you, you are going to be opposed. The Bible talks about don't allow your good works to be evil spoken of. Sometimes you are trying to do good things to people and they will criticize you for it. How many of you have ever had somebody criticize you for something that you tried to do good to them? Yeah, yeah, pretty much everybody. And you can think of things and, uh, you know, we have talked about with even family situations and, and various things that we go through those family situations, and we are trying to do the right thing, and we have family that criticizes us because of it. We have family, uh, you know, aunts and uncles or cousins or whatever that, um, that come against us. I can remember um, growing up that my, my dad's sister and her husband got, got in a tiff with my mom and dad one day, and, and it was over, it was actually over some biblical things, and they didn't speak for years, you know. We know how that is. You know how that is, that people will allow a seed of bitterness to get in and, to be, and a root to begin to grow, and, and it starts to pull you apart, and it starts to oppose your goodness, And so we have to understand that when we are servants, that sometimes that we are going to be opposed. We're going to have some things that happen. And so that's kind of the way that this this story comes in. Um, On down in verse 29, 
Uh, go on to the next slide. Verse 29 says, As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Marge, go ahead and read this. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. The story here kind of turns. Jesus has preached. Now it's time for, you know, after preaching dinner. So they're going to go home for the fried chicken and potato salad and all of the things that you used to do on, on Sunday afternoons after church, right? And so they go over to Peter's house. What does this say about Peter? The first pope of the Catholic Church was married. Because Peter was the first pope, according to the Catholic Church, right? So the first pope was married. Okay, so he's married. What else does it say about him? The obvious. What, what's it say about Peter? He must have cared about his, his wife's mother. He cared about his mother-in-law, right? Because she lived with him. And he cared enough about her that, they was, that he was concerned and that they were all concerned that she was sick. So as you read the story, Jesus goes over there. His mother-in-law is sick. Jesus reaches out and heals her. And immediately she gets up and she starts to cook for him. She starts to minister to him. Your servanthood can be contagious. And even though you might be running into oppositions and all of those type of things, your servanthood can be contagious if you will simply recognize people with need. One of the phrases that, that I cringe at, and if you've ever said this, don't worry about it because I've said it too. But... Um, Sometimes, I say sometimes, when people make this statement, it's because they don't know what else to say, and sometimes it's a placation. When somebody loses somebody in the family to death, what is it that they say? Sorry for your loss, right? Now, they might be sincere and they may not. I have had it both ways. When I lost my brother, when I lost my... Uh, my dad, uh, you know, when I've lost various people in my family, I've had people say, oh, sorry about, sorry for your loss. And I knew that they didn't really mean it. It was just something that they say, right? What is it that Jesus does here? He recognizes the actual need. And when he recognizes the need, he not only recognizes the need, but he fixed the problem. And that's the way that you and I need to be as servants because people don't always like to talk about themselves and their needs or their problems. So when you ask somebody how they're doing, they may say, oh, yeah, it's going good. And you know it's not going good. But what do we do? We just kind of pass it off. Because we want to be polite. We don't want to pry. But it's more important sometimes, let's say, for instance, somebody loses a family member, rather than just saying sorry for your loss, you say, how can I help you? You know, how can I assist you? What do you need? And you're, you're kind of digging in a little bit to them because you're recognizing their need because of that servant mindedness and because of a servant heart. So don't be afraid and don't be embarrassed that when you see people in need, that you recognize that. You recognize that need and ask the right questions. How is it that I can help you? You know, do you need food? Do you need money? Do you need us to pay a bill for you? Do you, you know, whatever it is, right? And so Jesus recognized the need of uh, Peter's mother-in-law, and he met the need. And immediately, once he met the need, that servanthood was contagious, and immediately she gets up and she starts cooking for him. She starts ministering them, uh, to, to all of them, okay? Okay, now... Uh, go to the next one. Okay. When evening came after the sunset, this is verse number 32, people brought to Jesus all the sick and the demons possessed. The whole town gathered at his door, and Jesus healed many of various diseases, and he also drove out many demons. 
And he would not allow the demons to speak because they knew who he was. And it's kind of important a little bit because it was, it was when evening came. It was the Sabbath. And at sundown at the Sabbath, see, people couldn't walk more than just a few, uh, you know, a few kilometers on the Sabbath, right? But once the sun went down and the Sabbath was over, then you could travel. And this is exactly what's going on here because the people now start to come to Jesus after the Sabbath. And why was that? Because they didn't want to be criticized by the Pharisees. Because they didn't want to disobey the law. Because they didn't want all of those things to be pointed out to them. As we see many, many times in the Gospels that the Pharisees criticized because of that, right? But after the sunset, they start to bring the disease, they start to bring the demon possessed, and Jesus ministers to all of them. And after he ministers to them, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and he left the house, and he went off into a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for them. And when they found him, they said, everybody's looking for you. And Jesus was probably like, yeah, I know everybody's looking for me, and that's why I'm off by myself. Because when we minister and when we are a servant to people, it takes a lot out of us. Whether that's going and helping somebody move, or whether it's going over and cleaning somebody's house, or whether it's going over and mowing somebody's lawn that can't get out to do it, or whatever, it takes out of us. When we minister to people, it's going to take out of us. And there has to be those times of refreshing when we are being servants that we are also uh, receiving something from the Lord. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing here. And Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach because this is what I've come to do. He's talking about his ministry in Galilee. This is the reason why the Father sent me. We're going to go and we're going to do this. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out the demons. Now, Verse number 40, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Leprosy was, um, was quite a big deal back then. Uh, we know it mostly now as Hansen's disease, and it is uh, mostly a kind of a neurological type of a thing that uh, nerve endings are not registering and not firing correctly in your brain. And so when you injure yourself, you don't necessarily know that you're injuring yourself. And then you continue to injure yourself over and over and over again. And then, um, then what happens is things get infected and, and all kinds of different things happen in that. Uh, I don't know whether this was the case in this, this man's life or not. But the leper comes to Jesus, crawling to him. And notice what the leper says. He says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He's asking Jesus for help. He does have faith because he knows that Jesus can help him. And Marge, read this next one. Then Jesus moved with compassion stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. In our servanthood, we have to be moved with compassion for people. And that's hard for some of us. Some people are sympathetic, and that's good. They can, they can kind of understand what you're going through because of things that have happened in their own past. Other people are empathetic, that they actually kind of put themselves in the place of the person that's hurting. And they take on that load and they take on that burden and it, and it goes to their heart. And when I see this story of Jesus and the leper, the leper comes to him and says, if you're willing, There was a, uh, there's one of the translations that says something about Jesus was incredulous. But when it says that, it wasn't in like a bad way of, of oh, you stupid leper. But it was, if you look in the original language, it was this. Jesus was moved with compassion. And he says, if I'm willing, of course I'm willing. And he stretches out his hand and he cleanses the leper. And... With, with that servanthood, we have to take on the compassion. So we've got to be servant-minded. We've got to kind of start where we are. 
we've got to recognize people's needs. And then we've got to be compassionate toward them. And we have to understand what people are going through and sometimes even put ourselves in that particular place. Okay? Go on to the next. Okay. So, he heals him. And when he does this, Jesus sent him away with a strong warning. He says, see that you don't tell anyone. But go and show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that the Mosaic commandment says for cleansing and the testimony to them. Because when you were cleansed from leprosy, which people were, then you had to go and you had to make a particular sacrifices to, you know, in the temple, to the priest. But the guy didn't listen to Jesus. The very last part of the chapter here. Indeed, he went out and he began to talk freely, spreading the news as a result, Jesus could no longer enter the town openly, but stayed outside in a lonely place. But yet, the people still came to him from everywhere. Because <laughs> Jesus knew what was going to happen. He knew that if he told, if he healed this leper, and that leper went out and started broadcasting it all over the place, that he was going to be, he was going to have a deluge of people that came to him wanting things. This was so much a part of Jesus' ministry when you read this. And as we go on in Mark, it, this is so much uh, a part of his ministry. And it is always helping people and meeting them at the point of their need. Healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, raising the dead, healing the brokenhearted, setting free the captives, forgiving sins. It was so much a part of his ministry. And that's the way that it has to be with you and me as servants also. Go ahead and stand. We have to start out with our inspiration as being servant-minded, just like John the Baptist was. We've got to begin at home, just like Jesus did with Galilee, his inauguration. We, we shouldn't worry about the criticism because there is going to be opposition. There's going to be people talking. There's going to be people you know, telling us that we're wrong, Right? We need to recognize people's needs, just like Peter's mother-in-law. Recognize the need there. And then we've got to identify with that need. And we have to have compassion and sympathy and empathy to those that are hurting and those, those that are in distress. And so this is a beautiful introduction to the book of Mark of how Jesus started his ministry as a servant and how you and I need to also follow in that and follow of being a servant. I want you to think for just a moment of maybe something that you did or something that you said or some act of kindness that you did. Maybe in the last few weeks, maybe because it was Christmas time. But think of how it is that you were a servant of Jesus and how you were servant-minded like Christ was. Just think about that for just a moment. Maybe it was just a kind word, somebody in the drive-thru, you know. Maybe it was letting somebody in in traffic. They don't even know that you were being kind to them, but maybe you were. But you were doing those things. And as you think about those, I think that God is going to give us the opportunity to be able to be a servant to people. And to ask the Lord to show us, how is it that I can serve? Who is it that I can serve? And I think that that's what it's all about. And that definitely is what the book of Mark is all about. So think about that and think about the opportunity that you have to be able to do that. I'm going to ask uh, Eric to come up and close us in prayer. And um, you can just you know, just do whatever the Lord's telling you to do. Well, I guess uh, in recognizing needs that we have in, in our church, I just want to put out there if there's something that we can pray for as a church. Um, don't be afraid to raise your hand or just speak up and and put that out there so that we can we can pray for it as as a church. Um, so I just want to give everyone that moment. If if there is something, we definitely want to pray, pray about it. 
Um, so, um, it, it's it's interesting. Um, every beginning of the year, we're talking about doing uh, resolutions and stuff, and and I feel like the most important thing that God has got me doing is getting back to prayer, consistent, consistent prayer, and um, and. Prayer, I think, is a lot of times taught to us as a young age as, you know, we pray before a meal, we pray before we do things. So we have this anxiety of like, okay, get this over with so we can some, do something good. And um, I, I just, I don't know, we need to get to a place in our life and even teach our kids that prayer is just, is the is what we're waiting for. That's, you know, we want the meal so that we can have the prayer, not the prayer so we can have the meal. We get it backwards, and um, because the prayer is is the meal, that is the food, and um, and I just just want to get my heart back to that, and um, and and just I don't know, I just want to lift up anything you guys might need this week. I know Heather and I both are just always praying about anything that I just I love that. I just love that. Um, I really do. I had a um, had have been having a, quite a few people calling lately asking for prayers. It feels like 24 is already kind of starting off like normal, uh, you know. And so we can't, there is no time, there is no rest, no rest for uh, for Christians at all in prayer. We, we don't we don't have a time to take a break. So um, we just, just keep praying, just keep praying. And um, so if anyone has anything, if not, I'm going to just, lead some time in prayer right now so okay heavenly father um gracious god we just we give everything to you father god everything father god to you tonight lord we thank you for um the opportunity to serve you another year uh we thank you so much uh for this upcoming year father god it looks as if we if we would detach from what the world has in front of us, Father God, we could see that you've, you, have, you have so much for us, so much wonderful stuff. We don't look to the politics and the things that are going on in the world. We just look to you, Father God. We look to you, Jesus. And we just ask, Jesus, that you would protect our families this year, surround us, Father God. Um, your Holy Spirit would just wash through our families, Father God, in a, in a big way. Um, my wife and I are praying this year be a year of family healing. I don't know a family right now that's not going through some type of um, separation of family. I, I can list off several family members of my own um, where we just need some really some healing. And my wife and I have been praying that, that uh, there would be a surprise this year, that there would be a family member, even if it's just one family member, that, that something that is broken would be fixed, Father God. And Lord, that you would bring, uh, just bring family back together, Father. Bring friendships back together, that you would, that this would be a year of restoration, Father God. We just ask in Jesus' name for restoration this year. Lord, I know there's a lot of people out there that need restoration and peace, and it's hard. It's hard. Forgiveness is hard, and, and, and humility is hard, Father God. But we just ask, Lord, that it would just, just come out of our hearts, Father God, that we would be, that you would show us ways, Lord, that you would lead the way, Father God, that we follow you, that we don't bring you into this restoration, that you bring us to this restoration in our lives, Father God. And we just thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Father God, for for our lives and, and for the peace and, the, and, and for this season, Father God. And we just ask, Father God, in your son Jesus' name. And we thank you so much for tonight. We thank you so much for Dave and Jeannie bringing the, the message. Father God, I just pray that uh, everyone gets home safe and um, watch over my wife. I pray she doesn't get too sick. And uh, uh, we love you. Uh, amen. Thank you. Amen. One more thing here. As he, as he come here, we're going to bless the children. Father, thanks for Esme, and uh, that you bless her this week as they go back to school, and that you would make her all that she is supposed to be in you. Father, I uh, 
also ask for Marge, Lord, as she goes back to school teaching. And, Father, that your Holy Spirit would be with her, too. Lord, I thank you for that. Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Blessings. See everybody next week.